Um, but in Argentina, they have a different policy. In Argen the Argentinian base in Antarctica is, um, welcomes families. So if you work at the research station there, your families can come. They have a school, um, and so you see kids there, which is a bit of an oddity. And so Emilio here was born in the Antarctic. And um, part of this reason is for family-friendly reasons, why they have uh, people, children in Antarctica. Um, but part of it is for nationalism. So to be born from a place sort of gives you a particular claim over a place. And part, and this is partly what um, Argentina is trying to do. They, they decided that women could give birth in Antarctica <coughs> to the first Argentinian Antarctican people. And so um, they're also trying to perform, uh, a, make a geopolitical claim here that Argentina and Antarctica, uh, Antarctica belongs to Argentina, partly because the geography, if you know, the tip of South America points out, and then there's a peninsula pointing up um, from, from Antarctica. They're quite close together. And so um, there's, their, their territory has also been claimed by the British. And so um, part of this is trying to establish more of a foothold in the Antarctic. But this person is not indigenous um, because just to be born in a place, as I said, doesn't make you indigenous. Um, there's an element of heritage and ancestry involved in being indigenous. Um, uh, mostly, what an indigenous person must claim is that their, their people have been there since the beginning of time. Um, and we can look at this uh, through the archeological record or anthropological record um, for scientific data on that. But in cultural anthropology, we take oral history just as seriously as scientific data. And so if we listen to oral histories telling us about how a particular group of people originated from the soil, or the gods placed them there, um, or, or however they originate, um, that is what makes them indigenous, that they've been there for a very, very long period of time um, in this place. Next, thank you. Another group of people in Antarctica who sort of complained about there not being indigenous people in the Antarctic were the environmentalists who advocate to protect it. Um, uh, but most of the environmentalists I studied had worked in environmental projects all over the world, in the rainforest, um, with deforestation, wilderness management, things like that. And the first thing sort of a global Western environmentalist would do when they wanted to protect an area is find a spokesperson for that place. And so, um, for, for better or worse, they would often find people who've been there a long time, a native person, an indigenous person, or a group of people who are willing to make some kind of alliance with the environmental group. Um, and so there are particular relationships to place. These aren't, we don't want to oversimplify this either though. Um, you sometimes hear over simplifications like indigenous people are close, close to nature, closer to nature. Um, it's important to, to remember that people are diverse. They're diverse within a community. They're diverse throughout the world. Um, and, and that indigenous people are also part of the contempor contemporary world. They're all part of, we're all part of sort of a, a global system. And um, they're, indigenous people aren't, they are tied to a place. They're native to a place but they also can belong to, to other, other worlds. Um, they're not simply tied to nature. So, okay. So uh, the Antarctic environmentalists said that they then had to act like indigenous people. Um, they, they had to become the spokespeople for the place, or they used penguins a lot, which would work pretty well. Um, but, but that, that indigenous people have come to represent particular environments um, it is sometimes helpful and then sometimes damaging as well. So I just want to point that out. Um, okay, next slide. Another thing that marks indigenous people 
in contemporary situations are their relationship to newcomers. Um, so I, I first want to say there are no uncontacted people in the world. We do have this sort of myth of uncontacted people. Every once in a while you find a uh, photograph or something on CNN about an uncontacted tribe in the Amazon kind of looking up at, at, at a helicopter or something like that. Um, and it's true those people are left alone, but that's a state policy uh, by the Amazon, by, excuse me, by the Brazilian government um, in consultation with, with those indigenous people in the frontier of Brazil. So these people know that the world exists. They belong to the world like we belong to the world, but they want to be left alone. Um, earlier relationships to newcomers, like colonial, colonial um, groups or missionary groups or uh, commercial enterprises, really felt like they had an obligation to save or civilize or rescue people from the land that they had been living in for thousands of years. This ended really badly, um, pretty much across the board, um, in various forms of uh, sort of intentional violence, like warfare, and unintentional violence, like the spread of disease, the loss of language, the loss of traditional family structures, um, and we could really go on. Um, and I don't know if that's gonna talk more about it. Um, so so the, the uncontacted <coughs> groups, and there are some in Brazil, there are some in Papua New Guinea, there are some in islands off the coast of India, but it's not because they don't know that the world exists, but because they don't, they've chosen deliberately as, you know, uh, as, as a community not to engage and then the government accepts the policy of not engaging uh, groups of people who choose not to be contacted. So when you hear uncontacted, it, it just means that um, this is sort of an agreement, it's actually a national policy um, to not engage uh, people who don't want to be engaged, which is, uh, took a few centuries of lessons learned. <coughs> so here we've got Shackleton's crew, um, they got stuck in the ice and ate a bunch of seals, and they all survived, but they didn't make it to the South Pole. Um, and so uh, the colonial guys, the explorers in Antarctica, appreciated that Antarctica was a terra nullius. And so if you look at the history of Antarctica, you can see these really uh, clear colonial or imperial land grabs um, that were unmitigated by uh, populations of people who were already there. So in some ways you can see unfettered colonialism, um, but you don't see that in histories of contact with indigenous people. Next slide. All right, so um, just to close with some key concerns for my overview on indigenous people. So uh, indigenous, People have priority to a place. They're the first people in a place. Um, and so that priority, indigenous people and their advocates argue, connote particular rights. They should have particular rights, cultural rights to practice their culture, um, perhaps uh, land access or access to resources or a share in resource extraction occurring in their land. Um, there's a UN Declaration of Indigenous Rights, and Jesse's gonna talk about that, right? Yep, oh, he's got something to say about that. Um, the matter of sovereignty, uh, the ability to, uh, to govern oneself, to um, make decisions based on customary law, um, which might be different than national law. Uh, racism, discrimination, and bias. Probably it occurs, I'll say it occurs with every indigenous population, even um, quite well quite well integrated societies like New Zealand um, has a pretty good bicultural uh, policy and culture. Um, still Maori people experience uh, racism, discrimination, bias, and all the sort of um, <coughs> outcomes about health and educational attainment and economic status. Um, that are uh, part and parcel of that. And then finally, so there's the challenge of being bicultural. So I said there's a few groups of people who are, are not 
in regular contact with the outside world. But for most indigenous people, you have to learn how to walk in two worlds um, to some extent, to speak two kinds of language. Even if you're speaking English, there are still different registers, um, uh, stories, um, educational systems, um, rituals, uh, two different senses of time or calendars. Um, this can be disorienting as well as productive. Um, and so I will just close with that. Thank you for listening. So I, I'm going to talk about uh, civil privilege, uh, but uh, at first let me take you for a moment to uh, California, uh, where uh, you see some images here uh, that fourth graders have constructed in, uh, uh, in, in school, uh, representing, uh, these are dioramas of Spanish missions. Uh, this is a project, the diorama project, that is required of all public school fourth graders across this, the state, uh, where children are taught uh, California, in, that in California history, uh, the Spanish uh, uh, generously established missions to peacefully convert native people to Christianity and assimilate them into Western culture. Uh, the only thing is that this is the only thing that California's public school students learn about California Indians. After fourth grade, curriculum on native people in California stops entirely. Uh, for the record, the Spanish missions were, were far from peaceful places, uh, and if, if, could you uh, uh, change the, the slide to the next slide? Thank you. And the Spanish missions did not assimilate the, the California Indians. Uh, the missions that existed uh, were only along the coast, uh, uh, not even really in the northern part of the state, uh, and they only existed for 50 years. So most California Indians, uh, uh, that were in the state at the time that these missions uh, uh, were operating, most did not go through the mission process. Uh, most were not assimilated there. Uh, but if you were to ask the uh, Californians today, they would tell you, well, here's a story that I learned in school. Uh, they were assimilated in missions uh, at end of story. Uh, in fact, not only did California's native communities survive the missions and other atrocities, uh, but California currently has the most Native nations of any state outside of Alaska. Uh, as you can see in the reservations uh, here. Could you, Thank you. So there's over 55 uh, federally recognized uh, Native nations in California right now. It's a little wonder then why non-Indians uh, uh, are so confused about it and so ignorant often uh, of their Native neighbors. Uh, our educational institutions continue to, to prop up these myths that America's native people have either been assimilated uh, or that they're extinct. And without any support from schools, whatever non-Indians know, or rather what non-Indians, what we think we know about Indians, often comes from the media. Could we have the, the next slide? Thank you. So what we're left with now is perhaps best predicted, uh, depicted by this cartoon. The, the young man says to the young woman, you know, really? You don't look like an Indian. Uh, when the only thing that comes to his mind are the images that he's seen from Dances with Wolves or Disney's Pocahontas or, or sports mascots, for example. And this brings me back to this idea of, of settler privilege. But first, we need to go over some, some definitions. So, you know, in the original meaning of the term, you know, uh, indigenous and native refer you know, simply to communities that have originated in a particular place or, or were the first inhabitants of a place. Uh, and in that sense, we all have ancestors that are indigenous to someone. Uh, and uh, for that matter, one could argue that the English are indigenous to England or, or the, the French to indigenous to, to France, for example. But uh, for what I'd like to talk about here, uh, today, that definition is so broad that it can obscure some of the inequalities that arise when one population uh, colonizes and, and displaces another. Uh, so for that reason, I, I prefer these following definitions here. Uh, if your ancestors are among those who moved to the land that we now know as America, uh, then they were settlers, and, and you're a settler too. 
And some people didn't move to America. America moved to them. If your ancestors were among the first to populate this land, uh, then your ancestors and you are indigenous. Uh, the term settler and indigenous, they, they define each other in this case. You can't have one without the other. Uh, of course, many Americans have mixed ancestry. Uh, their ancestors might include both natives and settlers. Uh, Many with mixed ancestry continue to live and identify with communities of, uh, of native people, while others have, uh, have no connection to, uh, to native communities uh, in the present day at, at all. Uh, in this case, defining privilege here, it's simple, but it can become a touchy subject uh, uh, if people are misconstrued in the wrong way. Uh, when the historical conditions uh, result in one group suffering from systematic disadvantages and others Others then benefit simply by not having to, uh, to endure those disadvantages. In, in other words, if, if others have it worse than you by virtue of who they are, then you have it better than them by virtue of who you are. And you have privilege. Uh, I know that I have plenty of privilege, uh, overlapping privilege, in fact, a white male uh, class and hetero privilege. And these come from factors that, that I cannot control, but I, I can recognize that by virtue of of who I am, I don't have to endure what, what others have by virtue of who they are. And to be clear, not every settler benefits equally from settler privilege. The, the diverse populations that migrated to this land uh, did not come with equal resources. Uh, some were brought here by force. Uh, others came as political or economic uh, refugees fleeing disaster. Uh, and for others uh, as well, um, uh, there's you know one population that not to be left out here as well would be uh, uh, those of, uh, uh, who had Mexican citizenship when the United States expanded uh, across the, and conquered the, the Southwest. Those settlers who benefit the most from the natural resources of this land are the ones that have the most settler privilege. It's not that everyone has equal amounts of settler privilege. The more that you benefit from the resources of this land, the more privilege that, that you have. For some people, again, it, might feel uncomfortable when, when discussing privilege. It, it can feel like, uh, like one, might, one might feel like uh, he's being uh, accused. Uh, someone might feel like they're being made feel uh, guilty about something that, that they didn't uh, do, for example. Uh, and after all, if you have white privilege, it's not like you could say stop being white. Or if you have civil privilege, it's not like it, it's as easy to just go up and, and, and leave and return to wherever your ancestors uh, made you from. The, the point isn't for you to change your uh, identity. Uh, the point is what you do with the advantages that you have. If, if you were born with advantages that others don't have, how are you using those advantages? Are you using them to help others that are less fortunate? Or are you at least not making it worse for other people? If you benefited from the natural, from the natural resources of the land now known as America, then that benefit originated, at least in part, by the displacement of Native people. Native communities continue to suffer disparities uh, caused by this displacement. American Indians and Alaska Natives have the highest poverty rate of any minority population. It's 26 percent, twice the national average. Native Americans and Alaska Natives have the lowest life expectancy of any minority group in the United States. At the Pine Ridge Reservation, not that far from here, life expectancy for men is 48 years. If Pine Ridge were compared with other nations, its life expectancy would be the second lowest in the Western Hemisphere, second only to Haiti. But this isn't in some far off land, this is next door in South Dakota. I could go on and on with, with disparities, but my, my point is that as long as Native communities continue to endure these, <coughs> these injustices, we settlers have to acknowledge that their suffering for the land and our benefit from this land share the same origin. Okay, so, so we said that some settlers benefit more from this land than others, uh, and, uh, and it's not like we can up and, 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 and leave, no one is, is, is suggesting that. So what can we do about the, the privilege that, that we have, those of us who, who are settlers, who benefit from settler privilege? It's not as hard as you think. You know, one thing to do for starters is to, to educate yourself about your, your native neighbors. If our schools don't educate our children about native people, we should demand that they do. We can't live in a society where the myth of indigenous extinction or assimilation thrives alongside resilient native communities. 
But with this education comes the realization that the challenges that face Native communities, of, of which there are many, are not the result of something intrinsic about Native people. Rather, they're the result of centuries of historical injustice. And, and we ought to hold our politicians accountable for this injustice. And finally, when it comes to, to Native people, or really any group that, that you don't belong to, you know, we need to forget the, the golden rule. Uh, you know, treat other people how you'd like to be treated. It's well-intentioned, but it's, it's close-minded. Instead, you know, follow you know, what we can maybe call the, the platinum rule. Treat other people how they would like to be treated. Uh, after all, not everybody wants to be treated the same way. And when you think that you might be helping someone, uh, when you think you might be playing someone a compliment, uh, for example, you might only be reflecting your own worldview. Let other people define their problems and then ask if there's some way that you can help. Thank you. Well, okay, I just wanted to say hi to Luke Newgard and Matt Lindstrom really quick. <laughs> What's good? <laughs> All right, um, I'm a fourth year senior from Alaska, and I'll, uh, okay, first, Native Americans were the first original conservationists. Uh, there's over 550 federally recognized tribes by the Secretary of Interior. If you combine all the lower 48 reservations and trust lands held in superintendents by the Department of Interior, there is about 56 million acres. If you go to Alaska, we have land held in fee simple, so they don't have tribal jurisdiction. It's uh, federally uh, mandated law uh, in state charter corporations, and we have about 47 million acres, and that includes corporations, native corporations, town sites and uh, allotments. And uh, there's about 4.5 million people that claim Native American ancestry. And Native Americans are known for poverty, low educational attainment rates, alcoholism, and suicide. But um, I'll speak on just a couple few quotes and uh, a couple eras in federal Indian policy. The problems on Native American reservations have drawn the attention of concerns Concerned citizens many times in the past. Critics of the conditions in the U.S. often point to American Indian reservations as examples of hypocrisy of a system that purports to provide liberty and justice for all. And this is uh, the first underclass area from a sociologist from the University of Wisconsin Madison. And then uh, this is uh, from a quote from Felix Cohen. He is known for writing which is known as the Bible of uh, federal Indian policy of tribal law. And it gets, uh, there's a new edition that gets published every two years. He says, like, like the uh, Miners Canary, the Indian marches shifts from fresh air to poison gas. In our prophylactic smear atmosphere, and our treatment of Indians even more than our treatment of other minorities reflects the rise and fall and our democratic faith. And this is a, uh, that was in uh, 1953. And this quotes uh, 1977 in the American Indian Policy Review Commission of the 95th Congress. Today, the past must be used as a backdrop rather than as indictment, but it is a backdrop that explains most of what must be known about the present day condition of Indians in the relation, relationship of the government and the rest of the American people is a way of seeing to the, what was it? It's in a way of seeing to the eyes of the mind of the Indian people today. And uh, during the Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act, this is a, uh, former Governor uh, Wally Egan's uh, testimony on subcommittee on Indian Affairs, on House Committee on Interior and Ins Insular Affairs, on uh, Last Minute Claims Settlement Act uh, hearings on HR uh, 3190 2nd Congress. Justice must be man-made in the end and will represent the balance of convenient interests. So, all right, with that, I'll uh, go to uh, 19, skip all the way down to 1492 with the discovery of America. Um, Columbus has a <laughs> discover of America as inaccurate and ignores the history of indigenous people. Uh, the history of immigrant indig of indigenous um, relations was meant to assimilate Native Americans 
and eradicate their cultures. Fairly new policies work to sever communal orientations and tribal ties to Native American homelands. Um, there was a period of war and conquest for the first, about the first, almost the first 150 years of the founding of this nation. And then reservations and removal and relocation policy uh, west of the Mississippi. This was led in concert with missionaries and boarding school with the government. This is a really dark side of history. So Native Americans lost their land, their history, their culture, and one of the least discussed, uh, some would consider genocides in world history. Now I'm going to the uh, Marshall Trilogy, which is a uh, Supreme Court Justice uh, John Marshall and the first disputed uh, significant Indian case. Uh, and, the very, and the very first case to come before the United U.S. Supreme Court involved in a significant Native American issue, Chief Justice John Marshall almost described the American judicial system as the courts of the conquerors. Thus, quote, the Supreme Court handed down a sweeping opinion that appropriate legal title to the U.S., even though it was the common, was still owned. occupied at the time by Indian tribes. Since that fateful decision in Johnson versus McIntosh, 1823, American laws often work against Native Americans legitim legitimizing the appropriations of their property and decline of their political, human, and cultural rights of indigenous people in the hands of the government. And this is uh, Walter R. Echohawk. He is from the five civilized tribes of uh, Oklahoma and East Seneca. And then that brings us to uh, the Trail of Tears, which was an executive order by President uh, Andrew Jackson, removed the civilized tracts of the Cherokee of uh, Georgia. They had their own written language and they're forced to remove all the way down to Oklahoma. And then uh, you got the Wounded Knee of the Gall of Lakota Pine Ridge, Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. And this is ground zero for indigenous rights. Today, yeah, I, um, let's see. Yep. Uh, the federal government basically arbitrated the Treaty of Fort Laramie and failed to protect the sacred lands of uh, Black Hills that the government said it would uphold. And then uh, the Department of War handled Indian affairs all the way up to the late 1800s, only after it turned over to the superintendents of the Department of Interior, Bureau of Indian Affairs, after the USDH and, uh, and a series of wars against Native American tribes to conquer and acquire most of the traditional lands. And then in the late 1900s, that same period, you got the Dons or General Allotment Act, which is a fire sale price for Native American land and it was the largest land steal in U.S. history for a bargain price. Native Americans lost approximately two thirds of their lands. And uh, this is why we have checkered jurisdiction and many reservations, especially across the Midwest. And this was the expected intended outcome of the federal Indian policy with big up tribal governments. And you skip past to the 1930s, you got John Collar and the New Deal, the Indian New Deal, and you got the Indian Reorganization Act, which uh, some Native American, some Native Americans uh, reservations actually did get some of the land back. And you skip past to World War II, and you got the termination era. Uh, a couple of tribes in Wisconsin and Washington terminated their tribal status to become U.S. citizens, and I forgot to say in uh, 1924. Native Americans were the last group to uh, gain suffrage as a legal right after blacks and after women. And then, uh, hold on a second. Termination era in the 1970s, and President Nixon, or you know, I'll go back to World War II. Um, the U.S. was willing to give the land to the Jews in Israel, but they, were, but they weren't willing to give land back to the Native Americans in their own backyard, which is seen as another social injustice. And let's get past to the 1970s. Uh, the U.S. Uh, we're a self-determination era from the 1970s to the present. If you ask who is the Abraham Lincoln of federal Indian policy and Indian affairs, um, if you ask a Native American leader, they'll say it was
President Nixon because he was the first president who advocated a self, uh, self-determination policy because his college football coach was Native American on a reservation in California. And one second. And then uh, the UN, Decla- UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People, the UN won't adopt this declaration because doing so would extend our legal rights to Native Americans. And so uh, in the capitalist society, some Native Americans would view there's no justice, and Native Americans are losers, losers in it, and have men. Uh, corporations come and go, for tribes will endure. And I really speak from this because I grew up in Native American culture. Um, and Southwestern Alaska and Bristol Bay, easternmost inlet of the Barren Sea. My mom's uh, 100% full Central Yupik Eskimo, and my dad is uh, primarily German and Irish. So, yeah, that's that's all I have to say about uh, federal Indian policy for today. I still like studying judicial decisions handed down by the by the Supreme Court and Alaska and Alaska Supreme Court as well. And uh, thank you for your time. So, uh, I understand that the question is, uh, in, in, uh, uh, in, in, in schools, children are being asked where, uh, uh, what nation is your, uh, what country is your family from? Uh, and, uh, and so you wonder what, uh, what, what might be a better way to, well, you to phrase uh, this? I guess you're, you're, you're all, I mean, I think you're not for other immigrants, you're doing it for other immigrants, and that's it. It's a, an interesting question to think about what is a, what would be a better way to, to, to phrase this for perhaps one that doesn't uh, privilege the, the immigrant experience. Um, I mean, I mean that, that it just something would come to mind to me. Perhaps it would just simpler would be, uh, you know, who are your who are your ancestors? Uh, you know, and, and what experiences did your ancestors have? Uh, would be something that would maybe much be much more uh, uh, inclusive. Uh, I would hope. Just to add, I think in anthropology, we always like to tend towards asking open-ended questions where the people who are answering the question get to choose the tone of the narration. So, so I, I agree with that. <laughs> Any other people? I have no idea if this question will, if you'll have anything to say to it, but um, is there any like worldwide recognized indigenous group from I'm not 
sure exactly what the region would be called, but uh, Israel, like that area. And if so, or not, what's the conversation around that? Well, I think that's, that's, thank you. <laughs> that's actually a huge uh, question. And I can't believe I'm answering it in the microphone, but I'm gonna. Um, so I think the Palestinians would say that they're indigenous to that area. I mean, I think this is a, one of the parts of the world that has been um, uh, conquered and resettled uh, so many times that uh, that the answer to your question would uh, really depend on, on who you'd ask. Um, and, uh, you know, there is not necessarily one uh, easy uh, answer that everybody can, can accept uh, for uh, in terms of who would be indigenous to, to Israel. Uh, an important question, but um, one that uh, is, is not as easy for people to, to reach a, um, a consensus on. Yeah. All right, so um, I'm kind of wondering, you are talking about a lot of issues that uh, Native Americans in the United States have. And uh, I'm just curious as to like, how federal uh, policy towards Native Americans, federal and state policy could be maybe how, uh, like, what, what would it be a better solution, or a better way to, it's better, better policy to, I mean, better for them, you know, you understand what I'm saying now. Like, what, what are some of the downfalls right now, and, like, how do we fix it? Where are we going from Well, I have, uh, Minnesota actually does have the office and department just to handle Indian affairs. In Alaska, it's a rural affairs, so Minnesota actually does have a, uh, they have about, I think it's about 11 reservations, but they have a, they have a department specifically just for indigenous immigrant relations within uh, that state, and the state of Alaska has a, a rural, uh, a rural uh, department to handle uh, those issues. And uh, other uh, states that would have a lot of Indian country would be the Dakotas, Montana, and uh, uh, Arizona. I, mean, I, uh, I mean, so as as you're saying, uh, uh, Jesse, uh, states themselves, state governments have have uh, you know, uh, and, and Minnesota as uh, you know itself has uh, has has its own way of, of recognizing it in relationships with with tribes. I mean, one one thing as, as well uh, uh, potentially would be uh, for the federal government to uh, uh, to strengthen. Uh, a, uh, indigenous people's self-determination uh, for those that, that, that have reservations and have that land uh, for uh, the federal government to, to stand up when others are coming in to take those resources uh, uh, away would, uh, that would just be one other thing that, that might come to mind. Um, Alright, um, so my question has to do with a big, like an important aspect for a lot of uh, Native American and Indian culture and uh, Well, in other places, this has been tackled a little bit. In Australia, they've um, implemented a major sort of policy overhaul to return land to Aboriginal title. Um, so there, that uh, indigenous people can, can be activists and uh, hire a legal team and try to get title. Um, I think that would be best. And, it, that works for nomadic or sedentary people. Um, it would just be sort of a large amount of space. Um, also in Alaska, and I know Jesse can talk about this with more expertise than me, um, but there is a sort of agreed upon legal access 
to federally federally owned land. Um, so there's sort of a bigger patchwork where, um, and they haven't made as many sort of national parks with really tight regulations. Instead, like um, we also see this in Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia, there are indigenous uh, land rights. So people practicing traditional lifestyles can access conservation areas um, for, for traditional practices. So it's been negotiated a couple of ways to access big amounts of public land or to literally turn the title over to indigenous people. And, and just uh, one uh, example from uh, the state of, of, of Minnesota, for example, would be uh, the federally recognized tribes in the state have reservations where they have uh, um, let's, uh, control of, of the land. Uh, uh, technically, on the reservations, the federal government holds the holds the trust for the land. Uh, but what we have in, in, in Minnesota as a result of, of treaty rights uh, is that. Uh, American Indian communities uh, have access to uh, to hunting and, and fishing uh, uh, that is uh, a privilege before uh, settler access as a result of these treaties. And so, for example, um, uh, uh, American Indians in, in Minnesota have uh, 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 ownership and control of their own reservation land uh, if, if they're a member of, of a federally recognized tribe, but then they also uh, are able to uh, fish before uh, fishing season starts, uh, for example, it is, uh, is, is how uh, one way in which the question that you're, being at, that you're asking is being negotiated here in, in Minnesota. It's a, a great question that, that you're asking, and it's it's partly why I uh, prefer a, um, a, a more uh, a narrow definition here. Uh, I mean, certainly, indigenous can, can mean uh, whoever is the first people from a certain place, and, and that is uh, a, a, you know, uh, an important distinction uh, to make. Uh, and as you bring up here, uh, you know, from uh, 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 from the archaeological record, uh, the suggestion is that would be for the by through the Bering Strait or some other uh, uh, passageway. Uh, uh, or some other travel means that uh, that the uh, American Indian population uh, uh, has their ancestry originally from uh, uh, from uh, from Eastern Asia. Uh, the uh, from the indigenous perspective, from their uh, from their worldview, they the, the belief is often that they've always been there. Of, of, of course, the, the distinction that I like to make when defining these is to really. Uh, think about it in terms of not how long has someone been here, but what 
uh, what are the power relations that occur when settlers arrive? When you have a population that's living in a certain place, and another population come, of settlers comes in and displaces that population, what is it that, that occurs at, at that point? Uh, uh, is, is there a, a vast amount of inequality that, that exists? Uh, because if you have settlers that are arriving and, uh, uh, and they are appropriating the land and the resources and the population that was there beforehand uh, uh, is, uh, suffers dramatically from it, um, that would be a, a context in, in which uh, we more often see uh, people invoking their rights, uh, those who have been dispossessed invoking their rights <coughs> as indigenous people. Uh, and so uh, I would define the terms more in, in, uh, in relation to, uh, uh, to, the, to the power balance between those who arrive and those who are being displaced uh, uh, instead of uh, some kind of a, a, a yardstick for how long someone needs to be in an area to be considered an indigenous. Any other questions? Hi, uh, my name is Simway. I'm a senior from Anchorage, Alaska. And um, Professor Brown, thanks for talking here tonight. I thought your talk was interesting, especially about um, education of Indians in California. And that got me thinking, like, growing up in uh, Alaska, throughout high school, we had to take one class called Alaska Studies. But when I think back, we didn't really learn about like, Alaska Native culture or anything. We learned about you know, buying Alaska from Russia for super cheap price, oil, oil boom, and like, all this thing about Alaska, but the native culture, like, do you think that's what needs to be changed? Okay, if you talk about Alaska, Alaska was sold to Russia in, I think it was 1848, no, it was, uh, it was in the uh, late 1800s, and it was for $7.2 million pennies an acre, and the, the legal, uh, well, the legal complexities of Alaska, it was in question for over 100 years till they settled the uh, Alaska Native Plains Settlement Act in 1971. And it only took oil, it took oil interests and uh, environmental interests to settle that issue when they had the 800 mile uh, Trans Alaska Pipeline and the North Slope region of the Arctic. And it was the, and it was in the really uh, 1960s, and it happened to be North America's largest oil discovery on any North American land. And, and, and in terms of for, for, for California, you know, for for example, uh, you know, I mean, this is you can imagine how confused, uh, especially now that uh, in California there are. Uh, uh, there's 55 reservations, a, a, a few of them, a, a, about six or seven of them have, uh, uh, now have uh, significant uh, uh, casinos that, that, uh, that, are, uh, that are prospering. Uh, most of us haven't benefited from that nearly as much. But you can imagine the confusion that non-Indians have when they're taught in school that all the message they receive is that, uh, or that California Indians are, are long gone. Uh, and then, suddenly they see the native nations around them gaining political and economic power, and they have no way of understanding what's going on. Uh, and so, I, I mean, I think that is something that needs to, to be fixed, and, uh, uh, you know, I mean, people will often uh, uh, say that tribes have so much power and influence over, uh, over, over government. Uh, if they do, I would imagine that would somehow be reflected uh, in uh, K-12 education. We're gonna take time for one more question before we're wrapping it up. Thanks again for coming and speaking today. I'm curious, and this could have been covered because I was a few minutes late, but are there good examples of settlers coming in someplace, either modern day or in the past, and not displacing the people who were there prior to the settlers coming in? Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of good examples. Uh, it, the best example I can see is through a, through the church. If uh, uh, if a native population uh, got uh, Christianized, or the uh, second example I would say would be through intermarriage. And uh, I've seen uh, a lot of non-native uh, non-native uh, community members 
and different communities across the state of Alaska that have actually helped with economic development with uh, tribal governments and native corporations. So uh, that's one way I've seen it in my experience at least. And uh, uh, through Native American boarding schools, which today now I actually work towards Alaska Native cultures and history. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, it, from a historical perspective, uh, you, you can look at areas where settlers have had little influence, where maybe their interest was primarily in, 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 in trade uh, and, and not in uh, in occupying the, the land. Uh, you can see some uh, examples of that potentially uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in the uh, uh, French colonies uh, in North America, uh, arguably in some areas maybe, uh, but. Uh, from a, from a modern uh, you know from a modern perspective, looking at modern day nation states, uh, there are some examples of of, of, uh, of states and governments that have uh, that, that are doing better work than others. Uh, uh, arguably, I think that uh, 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 New Zealand might have uh, uh, one of the more it's not perfect, but one of the more equitable uh, approaches uh, in terms of offering. Uh, 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 education uh, protection uh, for indigenous rights and, and culture. Uh, not that it's perfect there uh, at all, uh, but that uh, different governments handle this uh, differently and some with uh, more of an eye towards justice than, than others. Thank you. On behalf of both extending the Lincoln Trophy Center, thank you for all of you for coming out and participating in our discussion tonight. Um, extending the link and McCarthy Center both have some exciting events coming up. On Monday, this Monday, will be the Mark Kennedy Frontiers of Freedom Lecture Series with Matt Rhodes, Mitt Romney's former campaign manager. Um, this semester, we are also beginning TED Talk Tuesdays. Join us for a viewing of a TED Talk followed by a discussion. The first TED Talk Tuesday will be held on September 16th, and we will be viewing a TED Talk by Erica Chenoweth on the success of nonviolent civil resistance. If you're interested in participating, please email the McCarthy Center. Additionally, you should all get involved in the mentor program through the McCarthy Center, and you can sign up for this on the McCarthy Center website. And then ETL will be having a documentary showing and silent auction at the St. Joe Parish at 6 p.m. on Saturday, September 20th. So you're more than welcome to join us there. We'll be talking about our new documentary um, on the Sami indigenous people of Scandinavia in the Barents region. And then we'll be back here in Brother Willie's Pub next Thursday for our next Politics in a Pine. Join us for a discussion of race in the U.S. judicial system at 5 p.m. Thank you.